Size does matter. The modern state of Israel is actually quite a small place. It would fit rather comfortably within Lake Michigan. We think of Britain as a small country, but even Britain is several times the size of Israel. If we were to turn Israel on its axis, it would fit pretty much in southern England, south of the M4 motorway. And even then, it would exclude much of Kent. Now, in fact, the patch of land where Jesus supposedly performed his mighty deeds was even smaller than modern Israel. The triangle of land that today leads down to Elat in the first century was part of Nabatea, an Arab kingdom which later became Roman Arabia. A chunk of today's northern Israel was part of the Roman province of Syria, which included a region of self-governing cities called the Decapolis, which divided the small tribal areas of the Jews. Judea itself was the equivalent in size to the English counties of Dorset and Wiltshire, and Samaria equated to the size of Hampshire. Galilee, the heart of Jesus' land, was about the size of the English county of Surrey, about 50 miles long and 25 miles wide, smaller, in fact, than metropolitan Los Angeles. These small tribal kingdoms were never very stable. The Maccabean kings of Judea conquered their Arab and Samaritan neighbours in the two centuries before the so-called time of Jesus. It was this area which became the Roman client kingdom ruled by Herod the Great. Now, Herod accelerated the Romanization of the region, particularly with a series of palace fortresses and new towns named in tribute to his Roman masters. Foremost among these cities was the coastal town and port of Caesarea, which after Herod's death developed into the provincial capital five times the size of Jerusalem. In the year 6 of the first century, the heartland of Herod's kingdom became the Roman province of Judea. From Nabatea in the south to Syria in the north, the whole province was developed with new or renewed cities linked by a network of roads. Notice the names of these numerous towns and cities, quite unknown from the gospel narrative. The most developed and lucrative part of this region was not the Jewish enclaves of Judea and Galilee, but an area originally settled by the Greeks, the Decapolis, or Confederation of Ten Cities. Here were cities that straddled the trade route that ran from Damascus to Caesarea. They prospered for centuries and have left us many fascinating ruins, eloquent testimony to their former greatness. Now, the Decapolis is referred to in Mark and Matthew, but you would never guess from the casual mention the importance of the region. And Jesus, of course, never trod any of those cities. But what of Galilee, that pint-sized hub of Jesus' ministry? The passage of the Christian God-man should surely be evident here. We are fortunate that the first century Jewish historian Josephus has a lot to say about Galilee because he commanded Jewish forces here in the war against Rome. Now Josephus names 19 towns and villages in Galilee that he fortified for the coming war. Foremost among them was Jotapata, where Josephus himself was captured. From Jotapata, Josephus could have seen Nazareth, if it had existed. Now, Josephus tells us that he fortified Jaffa, the largest village of all Galilee. And Jaffa happens to share the same location as the invisible city of Nazareth. Did Jesus actually visit certain pagan cities? Sidon, Tyre, Caesarea Philippi, 
and gatherer. That isn't actually what the Gospels say. The writers keep their story conveniently vague. Where was Jesus baptised? Today, thousands of tourists visit the attractive baptism site of Yardenit, south of the Sea of Galilee. But Yardenit is completely fake, created by the Israeli Ministry of Tourism in 1981, when the traditional site had been long closed by war and minefields. So where was the traditional site? Only the Gospel of John gives a location, Bethany beyond the Jordan. So where was that? Even in the second century, Christians could not find such a place. Church Father Origen decided that what John really meant was Bethabara. And where was Bethabara? Well, it just happened to be the place where the Israelites had entered the Promised Land. But by the 6th century, Byzantine Christians had sighted Bethabara on the western side of the river, not beyond the Jordan at all. The Gospel of John mentions a second baptism site, Enon near Salim. So where was that? The church fathers decided it was south of Scythopolis, at a place called Salumias. But by the time Christianity was the official religion, Enon near Salim was placed opposite Bethabara, where they had once looked for Bethany. And why did they choose this place? Because this is where Elijah had ascended to heaven, and John the Baptist was, of course, the new Elijah. But when biblical archaeology arrived on the scene, determined Christians had other ideas. Salim was now equated with Sheshem, and they looked for an Enon, a word meaning spring, in this area. Then they found a village called Salem, and decided this must be Salim. As a result, Enons near Salims are all over the place, and are all bogus. One problem with placing the baptism site near Sheshem is that it was right in the middle of Samaria. Not so smart for a Jewish holy man, and of course nowhere near the wilderness of Judea. And where did Jesus meet the Samaritan woman at the well? The Gospel of John says Sychar, but this town was also unknown either before or after the time of Jesus. Christians decided Sechar was Sheshem. Here Joseph already had his tomb and Jacob his plot of land. So here they sighted a previously unknown Jacob's well, where Jesus could utter his words about living water. Where was the gated town of Nain where Jesus raised a widow's son from the dead? The honour has long been given to a village of a similar name first established by Muslims. But Josephus reports that Nain was far to the south on the borders of Idumea and that it had a wall. Where was Cana, that place that Jesus supposedly converted water into wine at a wedding? At least four places have been argued for, from one side of Galilee to the other, not one of them with convincing evidence. Josephus even refers to Canatha in the Decapolis as Cana. Where was Emmaus, where Jesus appeared to two of his followers after his death? Again, at least four places line up for the honour, but not one of them quite fits the Gospel story. So on the one hand, we have evidence, both from written sources and archaeology, of a great many villages, towns and cities but which have no place in the gospel story supposedly acted out all around them. On the other hand, we have gospel events in which the miraculous also happens to occur only in obscure or non-existent places, none of them important to Josephus or any other historian of the time. Bizarrely, Jesus manages to avoid all the towns that are on his doorstep and before the grand finale in Jerusalem avoids entering any city where there may have been an educated resident able to record his mighty deeds.
the conclusion is overwhelming. History and the gospel story exist in different universes. Jesus' land is a fictional landscape, a literary creation of an imaginary world for a Jesus who never existed.